Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us in this afternoon's program. We are very excited to launch the 2021 edition of Updates of Jurisprudence and Notes in Legal Ethics by our beloved Rex author, Attorney Frederick I. Anciano. Let us open the program with a prayer. We would like to enjoin everyone to be in the presence of our dear Almighty Father for opening prayer to be followed shortly by the singing of our national anthem. In respectful presence of our brothers and sisters across boundaries and faiths, let us all join in prayer and worship and gratitude and for guidance. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for the gift of life and all its joys. We thank you for today, for all its challenges, in all its splendor. We thank you for the gift of one another. O God of infinite mercy and wisdom, only in unity with your will can all our toils have true meaning. Transform us into willing and able stewards of this world and its future. Bring us together to work with understanding and compassion as we toil and grow weary. We pray for renewed strength and resolve. As we experience pain and sorrow, let us be reminded of untold good beyond. As we see pain and suffering, let us be instruments of your peace and extensions of your loving and healing hands. As we gather here today, bless us all that our collective knowledge be tempered and guided by your wisdom. Grant us clarity of vision to see the common good amidst all distractions. Endow us with humility and purity of heart to transcend all differences and reservations. When we leave this gathering, let us be the change we seek. As we endeavor to practice what we learn, let us be the good we want to see in others. As we work for our learners and their future, let it be that your will be done. In solemn silence, let us conclude with our own personal prayer. Sang Awit ng Pilipinas. everyone. Before we get to the exciting parts of the program, we would like to inform everyone that we have arranged an online raffle. Our dear viewers, you have a chance to win a copy of this book. Just register now on the link pinned in the comments to be included in our live draw later. 
If you are the lucky winner, comment present on the comment section within 30 seconds after we announce your name. Please take note that the raffle winner who's not able to comment present within the allotted time will be disqualified and the team will draw another winner. Announcement of one raffle winner will be done later before we end this program. So make sure to stay with us all throughout the program. Good afternoon once again, our dear partners in learning. 2021 is a big year for Rex, and we are happy to be able to share this milestone with you as we continue to serve you as the new Bigger and Better Rex Education. Education. We are now Rex Education. To tell us more about Rex Education and to officially open today's event, let us hear from Rex Education's Chief External Affairs Officer, Ms. Danda Kremelda I. Bukhani. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's Learning Pack Book Launch and Lecture. As we count down the months to the bar exams, it is with great pride that we present another stellar material that will hopefully guide our future lawyers into securing the future of service and integrity. This new book, of course, comes from Rex Education, a brand, a community, an advocacy, a tradition of service dedicated to inspiring every Filipino lifelong learner to advance themselves and uplift others. With 70 years of service and dedication to education, we have evolved from that iconic bookstore that we all know to something bigger and more significant. From just providing learners with published and educational materials, we are now accompanying everyone throughout their lifelong journey. Learning in all forms, beyond the walls of institutions, learning for delight, enlightenment, and fulfillment. And true to our tradition of service, Rex education is guided by the Educampion philosophy, which seeks to rally and empower education duty bearers. We believe that all of us are Educampion, champions for education, who are all working with these best interests of the Filipino whole learner in mind. As Rex education, our mission is to empower all duty bearers in the field of education to champion education no matter what the circumstances are. It is through and because of this that we are excited to spend the next two hours with you as we come together to unveil our most updated offering for the Philippine legal community. Friends and partners in education, may I present to you the updates of Jurisprudence and Notes in Legal Ethics, a new book for bar examinees, law students, legal practitioners to help you stay up to date and inform about the recent doctrines and rules enunciated by the Supreme Court. Just like any profession, ethics or codes of conduct exist to protect the sanctity of the practice and the integrity of the practitioner. This is why for the law profession to remain as one of the most honorable and noble profession that it has been through the ages, practitioners must not just simply add its principles inside the court, but also master its tenets and live them out in the everyday. Hopefully, this book will help everyone live in accordance with this noble endeavor 
as we put both into heart and mind the study of legal ethics. I have the honor to present the honorable author of updates on jurisprudence and notes in legal ethics. He is a court attorney in the office of the reporter of the Supreme Court for the past 20 years, and then a law professor at the Manuel Luis Quezon University and the University of Manila College of Law. He conducts pre-bar lectures in various law schools and review centers and is also a mandatory continuing legal education lecturer. Apart from updates of jurisprudence and notes in legal ethics, he has shared with Rex his expertise on other areas of the law, having authored previous books such as The Law on Sales and Updated Jurisprudence and Transportation Law. Without further ado, everyone, let us put our hands and hearts together and join me in welcoming our partner in championing legal education, attorney Frederick I. Anciano. Um, thank you, ma'am, for that um, wonderful introduction. Um, good afternoon or good, good evening to everyone. Um, thank you very much, ma'am Diane, ma'am Trixie. Uh, um, I'm Carla and I'm Jonah. Of course, I'm Jonah for always um, re uh, immediately responding to our uh, email. Uh, under na ba? Yes, hello? Oh, naka ano pala. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Okay na po. Sorry, naka-unmute. Okay, again, okay. Um, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, thank you very much, Ma'am uh, Buhain, for that very wonderful introduction. Um, first of all, I would like to um, thank and acknowledge, of course, uh, Rex Education, uh, kay Ma'am Diane, kay Ma'am Trixie, kay Ma'am Carla, kay Ma'am Jonna. Um, thank you very much uh, for this um, wonderful opportunity. So... Okay ba? Or nag -ano, static? So, anyway, um, I feel blessed and uh, I feel blessed for being a part of this um, Rex family. Why? Because um, it was a very big part of my law school life, itong Rex. Uh, as we all know, yung mga law students dyan at yung mga lawyers, Every time na pumupunta tayo sa Rex Bookstore, like in my case, uh, Morayta pa nun, every time na papasok ka sa Rex book, Bookstore, you are uh, amazed. Uh, para kang nasa museum. So, makikita mo yung mga libro and you, were all, uh, you will always idolize uh, some uh, authors. And so, it is a big part of my life during law school. And um, uh, hindi ko naman inakala na someday I will be also a part of uh, this uh, Rex family. Okay. Um, and also I would like uh, also to acknowledge and thanks before we start uh, my family. Si, Siyempre si my wife, Idel, Elijah, and uh, Yuan. Uh, thank you for uh, always being there. So, and my office mates at um, Supreme Court, Office of the Reporter, um, students sa uh, MLQU, sa uh, UM, and yung mga former kung naging um, uh, students sa uh, mga bar review centers. Um, uh, kamusta kayo? I hope all of you are safe. Now, um, let's go now to uh, yung book. Uh, my book. So my new book is titled uh, Updates of Jurisprudence and Notes in Legal Ethics. Now, um, what is the biggest challenge uh, to prepare this book? Uh, medyo malaking, malaki talagang challenge. Why? Because as we all know, legal ethics is a subject which is always uh, taken for granted. Uh, not only sa law school, but also sa bar exam. Why is it taken for granted sa bar exam? Because uh, legal ethics is uh, only 5% as compared to uh, the other uh, bar subjects. Tapos sinabay pa siya sa biggest uh, percentage ng bar, which is remedial law. So, of course, yung mga barista natin, mas magpo-focus sila uh, mag-aral during that pre-week sa remedial law. So, it is one of my challenge. Uh, how can I uh, introduce or present this legal ethics uh, in the sense that 
kahit onti lang yung time para ma-review nila yung legal ethics, uh, andun yung uh, bulk ng uh, possi uh, possible bar question. Also, it is being uh, taken for granted sa law school. Bakit? Eh, sa first year, legal ethics, isabay mo ba naman sa oblicon? Uh, isabay mo ba naman sa criminal law? Sa constitutional law? So, uh, medyo... Uh, it is being taken for granted. Tapos sa and other na mababigat na subject. So uh, it's it's a big challenge for me. Wala. Okay. Now, um, another challenge. Because when I was reviewing sa bar exam. Uh, of course, as I have said kanina, uh, binubuhos mo yung six days to review for remedial law kasi napakalaking um, percent niya, di ba? 20%. Ang sabi nga nila, ng no, mga nakasabay kong uh, barristers, huwag mo na reviewin yung legal ethics kasi uh, ang, sagot mo lang na, ang sagot mo lang naman dyan, para kang pare. Okay? Always, the lawyers, dapat ang sagot mo is always liable. And ang gawin mo na lang is just to memorize yung uh, lawyer's oath and then dun mo na lang kunin yung sagot mo. So, uh, paano natin maipipresent sa mga barristers, sa uh, mga law student na hindi lang siya basta ganun? Why? Imagine memorizing only yung uh, attorney's, uh, uh, lawyer, attorney's oath or lawyer's oath. Eh, paano kung itanong sa inyo sa bar uh, is, for example, distinguish between a retaining lien and a retainer fee. So, paano mo sasagutin siya using whether or not there is a conflict of interest. Wala rin siya sa lawyer's oath. So, hindi lang basta-basta pag uh, may memorize at pagpuwa sa lawyer's oath ang good um, uh, legal basis kailangan you should know what are the important principles, doctrines, and rules na meron tayo sa uh, legal ethics. Now, um, how will uh, this book uh, help law students, uh, bar examinees, and uh, of course, yung nasa uh, legal profession, uh, yung mga lawyers natin dyan. Sa law students, yung mga law students natin, this book will help you because uh, this book I provided for a subject heading in every important rules ng CPR. Anong example natin? Kasi uh, uh, napansin ko, if nung, nung nag-aaral ako, if you will read, let's say, uh, a certain rule under the CPR, let's say, sinabi ng CPR, uh, a lawyer is not allowed to borrow money from his client except uh, if the interest of the client is protected by the nature of the case or by independent advice. And also, The lawyer is not allowed to lend money to his client except in the interest of justice to advance necessary expenses. So, mabasahin mo lang siya na ganun. But we don't know na yun pala is about contingent fee agreement or champertus contract. So, in my book, ang ginawa ko para mas at least may idea yung readers natin kung uh, about kung tungkol saan yung binabasa nilang rule, I provided for such uh, subject heading. Like for example, in this, ito, Diba? Rule, that's rule 16.04. So hindi natin alam na yung mahabang uh, rule na pala yun, it's about contingent fee or uh, champertus contract. And also, uh, yung rule na a lawyer shall not make public statements in the media regarding a pending case tending to arouse public opinion for or against a party. Siyempre, wala sa CPR yon na sinasabi na sub rule siya. So again, in my book, nilagay ko as a... Uh, subject heading yung title or yung topic noong rule na yun. And also, this book will help uh, law students with regards to yung mga new rules natin like yung uh, AM number uh, 19-03-24SC also known as the revised uh, law student practice rule. Nandito rin po sa book natin. And of course, yung bagong um, jurisprudence uh, with regards to the constitutionality of um, Filsat. Uh, of course, you know that case. Uh, nandito rin sa book natin yun. Uh, 
it was thoroughly um, um, discussed. And also in this book, it will help bar examinees, yung ating mga barista. Why? Because uh, this book, of course, from the title itself, updated jurisprudence. So niligyan natin ang mga bagong cases dito. Uh, it's very he helpful for our uh, examinees. And also, this book contains uh, bar Q&A. And of course, uh, naka-discuss naka, naka doon kung ano yung mga tamang sagot at kung ano yung mga bar favorite na laging tinatanong sa legal ethics uh, exam. And another uh, another advantage, as you can see, medyo manipis siya, this uh, book is very concise. Para, as I've said nga, uh, pag nagre-review ko sa bar, mas maganda kung mas maraming uh, time nyo ay uh, mapunta sa pagre-review sa remedial law. So, maiksi lang yung uh, book natin. Uh, it has uh, four parts. First is about the practice of law. Second part is about the code of professional responsibility, which is the present main legal basis of legal ethics. And the third part is about um, disbarment. And the last part is about uh, notary public. And as I've said, uh, how can it help uh, lawyers or um, yung mga kasamahan natin sa legal profession? This book can help uh, lawyers because it contains yung mga new cases with regards to um, MCLE, Mandatory Continuing Legal Education. Ano ba yung um, uh, legal effect if the lawyer fails to comply with the uh, MCLE? Uh, ano ba yung remedy? So, and ano yung sanction? Also, this book, it provides for, um, as I've said nga sa legal profession, sa mga lawyers, uh, new cases regarding disbarment such as ano ba yung mga allowed pleadings if uh, a disbarment case is filed against a lawyer before the CBD or Commission on Bar Discipline. Ano, ano ba yung pwede dyan? Pwede ba dyan yung verified complaint? Pwede ba dyan yung verified answer? Pwede ba dyan yung position paper? Or pwede ba dyan yung motion for reconsideration? Nandito sa book. Pwede, uh, also, another topic is about what if the disbarment complaint was directly filed before the Supreme Court? Ano ba yung ginagawa ni Supreme Court pag yung uh, disbarment complaint was directly filed before the Supreme Court? I-re-refer ba niya sa OBC? I-re-refer ba niya sa IBP? I-re-refer ba niya sa judge? So, those, uh, those uh, topics. And of course, since we're talking about lawyers, uh, members in the legal profession, uh, meron din tayong um, topic here with regards to a lawyer who is also a public official. Nakadiscuss din dito kung pwede ba sila mag-practice ng kanilang profession during their incumbency as a public official, whether an appointed official or an elected, uh, elected official. Uh, sabi, sabi nga doon, if a lawyer who is a uh, public official, you should first determine whether uh, the prohibition for him to practice law is a, a restrictive prohibition or an absolute prohibition. Diba? Uh, absolute prohibition, when we say absolute prohibition, uh, hindi talaga siya pwedeng mag-practice ng law during his or her incumbency. And sino-sino yun? Of course, the president, vice president, members of the cabinet, uh, justices, judges, uh, fiscals, uh, ombudsman, members of the constitutional commission, governors and mayors, so sila yung mga uh, public officials who cannot practice law during their incumbency. But uh, it was discussed in my book na mayroong mga public official na mga abogado na pwedeng mag-practice uh, kahit na during their incumbency, yes. At sino-sino yun yung nagpo-fall dun sa restrictive prohibition such as, number one, the senator, our senators and congressmen. Kasi they are uh, prohibited under the Constitution. Uh, they are only prohibited to personally appear. But they are allowed to prepare yung mga legal documents. They are allowed to give uh, legal opinion. Okay. And number three. Ah, number two pala. Of course, yung ating mga counselor, sanggunian members. Yung ating mga counselor, sanggunian members na mga abogado, during their incumbency as a counselor, they can still practice law. But there are restrictions. Ano ano yung mga restriction? Restrictions. First, you should determine if it is a civil case or it uh, it is a criminal case or if it is an administ administrative case. Why sir? Kasi 
if it is a civil case, a counsel or lawyer cannot handle such civil case if the adverse party is a government official or employee. Okay? Now, what if it is a criminal case? A criminal case naman siya, ang isang abogadong counselor, he can handle uh, such criminal case provided that the accused, uh, the accused is not a government employee or government official and uh, the such accused should not be a charge of an offense in relation to his public office. Bakit? Kasi pag ang represent ni counselor lawyer ay isang uh, accused and that accused is a government official or employee and such a accused government official or employee is charged of an offense in relation to his public office, si counselor lawyer ay na, uh, is not allowed to represent such client. And in so far as to administrative case, ang isang counselor na abogado, uh, he can represent such case provided that hindi siya mag-a-accept ng compensation. And of course, the last one, uh, falling dun sa restrictive prohibition are uh, yung mga ating mga re uh, retired judge and justices who uh, is availing a pension under RA 910. So if they are receiving pension, yung ating mga retired judge and justices, if they are receiving pe pension under RA 910, generally they are allowed to practice no, pagka-retire, but they cannot accept uh, clients if same siya doon sa uh, counselor lawyer. Pag uh, retired judge or justice, hindi niya pwede accept yung uh, civil case. If the adverse party is a government employee or official and if it is a criminal case, the retired judge or justice is not allowed to accept it. If the accused is a government employee and was charged of an offense in relation to his public office. And in so far as to administrative cases, hindi pwede accept ni retired judge or justice if merong compensation. Okay? So, uh, let's go to my uh, lecture proper. I just want to discuss those important uh, topics uh, na nandito sa uh, libro natin. So allow me to uh, share my screen. Okay. So uh let's start. So these are the ano, uh, important topics, significant topics. Uh, we can say the parang bar tips in so far as to uh, the CPR is concerned. Ano ba yung mga possible or probable uh, bar topics na pwede itanong na lagi siyang tinatanong sa legal ethics and practical exercises. Although I, uh, I'll be focusing only sa CPR. Okay? Focus lang tayo doon kasi uh, legal ethics and practical exercises kasama dyan yung code of judicial conduct and legal forms. So focus lang muna tayo sa legal ethics. Okay, so sa legal ethics, sa code of professional responsibility, as I have said nga, this is the kumbaga, Bible natin sa legal ethics because it, it is the present main legal basis in legal ethics. Now, um, first of all, we should first is, uh, de define what is legal ethics. So legal ethics... Uh, it is a branch of moral science which deals with the duties which a lawyer owes to the society, to the legal profession, uh, to the court, and to his or her client. Okay, so pag pinapadefine ko nga yan sa class, legal ethics, tatlong line lang ang tatang, tatandaan natin. Legal ethics, number one, is a branch of moral science. Okay, number two, which deals with the duties which a lawyer owes. Tapos yung number three, third line natin, yung fourfold duties. Duty to the society, uh, duty to the legal profession or bar, duty to the courts, and duty to the client. Now, yung CPR natin is composed of the fourfold duties of a lawyer. Why? Because 
yung canon 1 to 6 natin is the duty of the lawyer to the society. Okay? Now, yung Uh, canon 7 to 9 natin is yung duty of the lawyer to the legal profession or to the bar. And canon 10 to 13 natin is duty of the lawyer to the court. And canon 14 to 22 is the duty of the lawyer to his or her client. Now, uh, allow me nga to discuss what are the important topics under uh, the CPR. So first of all, let's discuss... Topic number one, this one, your favorite, purely personal or private activities of a lawyer as a defense. Ano, anong ibig sabihin nun? Pag ang isang abogado po ay finailan ng disbarment and uh, the ground is because of the private or uh, yung personal activity ng lawyer, purely personal in nature. Ano example natin? Uh, total usong-uso, uh, a lawyer Uh, posting in TikTok. Let's say, nagtitiktok siya, and pag nagtitiktok siya, since mahilig siya mag-gym, so nag-reflex siya ng muscle niya in the sense that nag, uh, he or she is dancing naked. Almost naked. So, here comes a complainant. Finailan siya ng disbarment complaint. Kahit sino ba pwede mag-file ng disbarment complaint? Yes, because This barman complaint is sui generis or a class of its own. It is neither civil nor uh, criminal proceedings. It can prosper even without a complainant. So, uh, hindi natin kailangan ng real party ni interest in so far as to filing a disbarment complaint. Why? Because disbarment complaint does not involve a private interest. It involves the public. So, yun na nga. Finailan ng disbarment complaint itong isang lawyer na mahilig mag-tiktok ng almost naked. So, anong defense ngayon ni lawyer? Sabi ngayon ni lawyer, uh, the disbarment complaint should be dismissed. Why? Because, sabi niya, it is a purely personal activity. Okay? Purely personal activity siya. It has nothing to do with the legal profession. So, bakit daw siya madidisbar? Tama nga naman, private or personal activity siya. Now, Question, pwede ba siya ma-disbar in the sense that there is a violation committed under the CPR? Yes, because of uh, Rule 1.01. Okay, yung tinatawag natin na catch-all provision. Ito nga yung if wala ka na talaga maisip na legal basis, you can write this one kasi ang tatandaan nyo lang sa so 1.01 is a lawyer shall not engage in, alam na alam nila yan, you did. A lawyer shall not engage in unlawful Uh, dishonest, immoral, or deceitful conduct. So, it can be a violation in a long line of cases of the Supreme Court pag purely personal activity ng lawyer ang kanyang defense, ang kanyang disbarment complaint, pwede pa rin madisbar because of 1.01. More so, talun lang tayo doon sa duty of the lawyer to the legal profession, uh, specifically ang violation nun ay ang Rule 7.03. Okay, 7.03 kasi hindi pwedeng maging defense ni lawyer na private in nature yung kanyang ginawa. Kasi sabi ni uh, Rule 7.03, a lawyer shall not engage in conduct that adversely reflects his fitness to practice law whether he or she in private in public or private life engage in a scandalous manner to discredit the legal profession. Meaning to say kahit na private act siya If he or she is engaging, uh, if yung act niya discredits the legal profession, it can be a ground for this barment. Okay? So yun nga po ang legal basis natin if the, the topic issue ng bar question pinresent sa inyo this coming January is about uh, private activities of a lawyer sa defense in a disbarment complaint. We have 7.03 and 1.01 of the Code of Professional Responsibility. And of course, in a long line of cases, ito lagi ang sinasabi ni Supreme Court pag ito ang defense ni lawyer. Sabi niya, sabi ni Supreme Court, uh, there is no distinction as to whether the transgression is committed in a lawyer's private life or his professional capacity. Why? Because a lawyer may not divide his personality as a lawyer at one time and a mere citizen at another. Okay? So yun po yung sinasabi ni Supreme Court pag ang 
defense ni lawyer ay purely personal activity or private activities. Okay? So let's go na to the second topic issue. Okay? Delegation of tasks to unqualified persons. So, lagi rin tinatanong sa bar yan. This is very important. Of course, nasa libro natin. Pwede, pwede ba i-delegate ng isang abogado ang isang legal task to a non-lawyer? O baka maraming ano, tamaan. Pero anyway, uh, the rule is that a lawyer shall not delegate to any unqualified person the performance of a task which by law may only be performed by a member of the bar in good standing. So delegation of legal task, kailangan i-delegate, pwede siya i-delegate ethically by a lawyer to a lawyer. Okay? And take note, kailangan yung pagde-delegate niya ng legal task na isang lawyer, hindi dapat suspended kasi hindi siya considered as in good standing. Kasi sabi nga ng uh, CPR natin, a lawyer shall not delegate to any unqualified person the performance of a task which by law may only be performed by a member of the bar in good standing. Okay? Ano yung mga um, what case is that? Tapay versus Bangkolo. So in that case, anong ginawa ni lawyer? Uh, wala siya sa law office or uh, wala siya uh, to sign the pleading. So anong ginawa ngayon ni lawyer in that case? Tinawagan ngayon si sekretary niya, sabi niya, ibay mo na lang signature ko dyan and then ifile mo na sa court. So ano nangyari? Of course, liable ang lawyer because it is violation of 9.01. Kasi nga, a lawyer should not delegate to an unqualified person the performance of a task which by law may only be performed by a member of the bar in good standing. And take note, diniscuss din ni Supreme Court doon, bakit bawal ipapirma sa iba ng abogado uh, yung pleadings na ginagawa niya. Because we have uh, yung bagong rules sa 2019 uh, amended civil procedure. What is the significance of a lawyer's signature in every pleading? Kaya hindi pwede i-delegate ng isang abogado yung kanyang legal task to a non-lawyer. Okay? Under the 2019 uh, civil procedure, uh, amended civil procedure, di ba? Pag pipirma ang isang abogado ng pleading, kailangan uh, sinesertify niya na number one, he has read the pleading. Number two, that based on his kib. Ano yung kib? K-I-B. That based on his knowledge, information, and belief. Okay? So yun yung difference nga pala, naalala ko lang, difference ng significance of a lawyer signature sa verification. Pag significance of a lawyer signature in every pleading, kib will suffice. Knowledge, information, and belief will, will suffice. On the other hand, if it is uh, uh, verification, yung preparation of verification, kailangan personal knowledge or based on authentic records. Okay, anyway, let's go back to significance of a lawyer signature. Bakit hindi na pwede i-delegate yung legal task? More so yung signing ng pleading. Kasi nga, he, he certifies that he has read the pleading, that based on his uh, knowledge, information, and belief, after reasonable inquiry, kailangan pala before pinirmahan ni lawyer yung pleading na yun, kailangan tinanong niya muna yung client niya or yung sarili niya. Ano yung tatanong niya? Okay? So under Rule 7, Section 3, it constitutes that he has read the pleading that based on his knowledge, information, and belief, after reasonable inquiry that, number one, it was not presented. Not presented to what? Not presented to harass, not presented to uh, increase the cost of litigation. Okay? Number two, uh, reasonable inquiry that their claims in so far as to complaint is concerned or defenses in so far as to an answer is concerned, kailangan it must be warranted by existing law or jurisprudence. Okay? So the claims or defenses na i-allege ng isang abogado sa isang pleading, uh, it must be warranted by existing laws and jurisprudence. Number three, ano yung uh, reasonable inquiry niya, yung pangatlo? Those factual contentions. Yung mga factual contentions na nilagay ng lawyer sa kanyang pleading, okay, it must be warranted by evidence. So bago niya pirmahan yung kanyang pleading, kailangan warranted by evidence yung mga factual contention alleged therein. 
Sir, paano kung hindi available yung mga evidences na nakalagay doon? Uh, you should state that he can uh, he can provide such um, evidence evidences after availing the modes of discovery. And number four, he should uh, inquire if the denials or defenses are also warranted by evidence. Okay, and if not available, it will be available after availing the modes of discovery. Okay, so that's why a lawyer cannot delegate uh, his legal tasks more so yung signing of a pleading to a non-lawyer. And of course, nadaanan na rin natin yung the case of uh, Uy versus Attorney Maghari. What are the mandatory informations that must be stated under the lawyer's signature in every pleading? Pagka-pirma, napapansin nyo, di ba? There are mandatory informations stated under the signature of a lawyer. So ano-ano yun? It's a reminder, of course, the ro roll number. What else? The contact number, yung lawyer. The address. What else? The MCLE, compliance number. What else? IBP, uh, IBP receipt number and date. And yung PTR number. Okay? Now, um, topic issue number three, another important topic under uh, the CPR is about the criticism against rulings of courts. Okay? So, pwede ba na ang isang abogado or even uh, an individual, a layman, but let's focus on uh, lawyers, can they criticize the rulings of the Supreme Court? So, marami mga students sumasagot. Of course, hindi because it will be a uh, disrespect sa Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court, Supreme Court uh, sinabi mismo na, yes, a lawyer or an individual can criticize us, yung rulings namin. Why? Because you have your constitutional right of uh, freedom of expression. Okay? But in, the, in one case, the case of Saldivar versus Gonzalez, Kasi in that case, si lawyer, kinikriticize niya yung rulings ng Supreme Court and finailan siya ng sinoko siya ni Supreme Court. At ang kanyang reason, ang kanyang defense, um, meron nga siyang constitutional right of freedom of expression. So, anong sabi ni Supreme Court? Sabi ni Supreme Court, yes, you have your right to uh, criticize us because you have your constitutional right of freedom of expression. But take note, same thing as to all other uh, constitutional right it is not unlimited. Diba? It, is, uh, it is not absolute. There is a limitation. Eh, sir, ano ngayon yung limitation para makriticize natin yung rulings ng uh, mga court or even the rulings of the Supreme Court? So the standard for us to uh, ethically criticize the rulings of the courts, uh, ang, ano natin dyan, ang standard natin is the case of Inre Almasen. Inre Almasen, which was spent by Justice uh, Castro, sabi ni uh, Supreme Court in that case, criticism, you can, yes, you can criticize the courts, but the criticism must be bona fide or genuine and it should not spill over the walls of decency and propriety. Okay? So again, criticism is allowed provided that criticism is bona fide and it should not spill the spill over the walls of decency and propriety. Okay? Yun, Saldivar versus Gonzalez. Uh, ganun din yung nangyari sa case ni Doktora Vicky Velo, Hinares versus Attorney Guevara. Same uh, doctrinal pronouncement. Yan. In real masen, criticism must be bona fide and should not spill over the walls of decency and propriety. So we can criticize the rulings of uh, the courts. Now, take note nga pala, baka yung i-present sa inyong bar question, yung kinikriticize ng lawyer is yung uh, pending, uh, yung kinikriticize ng lawyer is a case which involves a pending uh, naka, uh, pending uh, litigation. Okay, so kinikriticize yung isang kaso but it is still pending. So in such case, hindi natin ipapasok yung principle ng Saldivar versus Gonzales or Vicky Velo versus Attorney Guevara. Okay? Kasi if the case is still pending and it was criticized uh, by a lawyer or even an individual, ang 
possible topic na papasok dyan ay yung sub-judice rule. Diba? If you still remember the sub-judice rule under the Code of Professional Responsibility, sinasabi ng CPR natin na uh, a lawyer shall not make public statements in the media. So tatlo nga pala yun. Kung baga tatlong element para pumasok yung violation ng sub-judice rule. So uh, there's a violation of the sub-judice rule, therefore there's a violation of the CPR and it can be a ground for disbarment. If yun nga, a lawyer kasi, sa pinagbabawal ng CPR, a lawyer shall not make public statements in the media regarding a pending case. And number three, uh, which tends to arouse public opinion for or against a party. Okay, so if you can see sa TV, sa news, bakit may mga lawyer na pag ini-interview sila, sinasabi nila na nakapending sa ganitong court yung kaso namin. Bakit hindi sila nasa sub-judice? Because of the absence of the third requisite. Okay? They made a public statement before the media, pa-interview, Facebook or whatever, regarding a pending case. Yung case is not yet final and secretory. But yung third requisite, it does not tend to arouse public opinion for or against a party. So mere saying during your interview na mayroong nakapending case na ganitong kaso, uh, uh, will not suffice for that lawyer to be disbarred on the ground of violation of the sub-judice rule. Ayan nga. So bar question must be distinguished if the case is still pending. If the case is still pending, yung sub-judice rule principle ang papasok under Rule 13.02 of the Code of Professional Responsibility. And another, uh, ano lang, pinasok ko lang, criticism, uh, against the personal and or official conduct of a judge. So ito more specific, yung personal act ni judge or yung official conduct ni judge. Pwede ba i-criticize ng isang abogado? Sa tingin nyo, of course, pwede. Take note of that. But uh, please be aware of Rule 11.05. Okay? Tayong mga lawyers, pwede natin i-criticize uh, yung personal conduct ng judge or even the official conduct of a judge but it should not be in an insulting or intemperate manner because sabi dyan sa 11.05 a lawyer shall not criticize the personal or even the official conduct of a judge in an insulting or intemperate manner so um, implied you can criticize yung personal or official conduct ng judge basta hindi in an insulting and and, and in an intemperate manner. And of course, you should take into consideration if the criticism is a destructive criticism. Kasi ang allowed lang to criticize the courts uh, is yung uh, uh, destructive criticism bawal. Okay? Pero merong uh, criticism which is allowed. Yung criticism which you are only using uh, such criticism in order to rectify the errors committed by the court. But if it is a destructive criticism, meaning to say you are using uh, offensive language, uh, you, see, you are using derogatory language in order to offend the court, so such criticism is unethical. Next. So let's discuss about uh, the retaining and charging lead. Ito nga yung sinasabi ko, uh, yung sa rules natin sa CPR, uh, mahirap i-distinguish lalo na pag uh, first year ka, alin ba dito yung papasok yung principle ng charging lien? Alin ba dito yung papasok na? Papasok yung principle ng retaining lien. Now, ito nga yung paalala natin na nakalagay din sa book natin and even in, uh, during my lectures, before natin maintindihan yung principle ng retaining lien and charging lien, we should first uh, know the rule that a lawyer shall deliver the property or money of the client when due or upon demand. Again, basic is the rule that a lawyer shall deliver or return the money or property of the client when due or upon demand. Sir, papaano kung may unsatisfied attorney's fees si client? Pwede ba i-retain ni lawyer yung pinagkatiwala sa kanyang papers, money, funds? Okay? So, ang sabi ng Supreme Court in a long line of cases, uh, kahit na may unsatisfied attorney's fees si client okay sabi ni supreme court a lawyer has no right to uh, appropriate 
the money or property of the client just because of the mere fact that the client owes him an attorney's fee. Okay? So a, law, a lawyer, uh, is it is not allowed for a lawyer to appropriate the money, property, or fund of the client just because of the mere fact that the client owes him. Why? Because it will uh, the there will be a presumption pag ganun ang ginawa ni lawyer ano ang magiging presumption there will be a presumption of misappropriation so sir ano ngayon ang remedy ni lawyer eh kulang yung uh, may balance pa sa attorney's fees si client that uh, that is the only time wherein the lawyer can exercise tong tinatawag natin na retaining lien okay why ano ba tong retaining lien uh, retaining lien will come into the picture if the following requisites are present. Number one, there must be an attorney-client relationship. Anong ibig sabihin nun na mayroong attorney-client relationship? As held in the case of Burbe versus Magulta, there is an attorney-client relationship if a person with regards to his business or troubles of any kind approach a lawyer. So that's the first requisite. I'm talking about sa ano, attorney-client relationship. Number two, the purpose of, uh, the purpose of such uh, person is to obtain legal advice okay and number 3 requisite ng uh, uh, attorney client relationship the lawyer voluntarily permits uh, the consultation okay so, so kung present yung Borbe versus Magulda natin uh, okay na yung uh, first requisite natin para pumasok yung retaining lien okay number 1 there must be an attorney client relationship Number two, uh, there must be an unsatisfied attorney's fees. Dapat may kulang si client. May balance sa uh, acceptance fee, may balance sa uh, appearance fee, may balance sa uh, pleading fee. Okay? Number three requisite para may exercise yung retaining lien. It must be exercised before judgment. Okay? It must be exercised before judgment. Kasi yun yung uh, distinction between retaining lien and charging lien. Kasi charging lien, it can only be exercised after a favorable money judgment. Okay? So yung retaining lien, ma-exercise lang siya before judgment. And number four, yung funds na yun, yung property na yun, yung document na yun, was obtained by the lawyer lawfully. Okay? So na-possess ni lawyer yung property, funds, or document lawfully. Meaning to say, hindi niya basta-basta kinuha kay client kasi alam niya na hindi siya babayaran. Pinagkatiwala ni client yung money, property, or documents kay lawyer. Okay? And of course, there must be uh, under the ano, constitutional right of uh, due process, there must be a notification. Kailangan inotify ni lawyer na i-exercise na yung retaining lien. Okay? So that's the retaining lien. So again, pumapasok lang ang retaining lien and charging lien if there is an unsatisfied attorney's fees. Okay? Kasi yun yung difference niya sa champertus and contingent fee. Kasi when we talk about uh, contingent fee and champertus contract, pumapasok naman yun if the lawyer will lend money to his client na i-discuss natin mamaya. Let's go back to retaining lien and charging lien. So okay na tayo sa retaining lien. Charging lien, okay? Ganun pa rin. There must be an attorney-client relationship. The principle of Burbe versus Mag Magulta must be present. Number two, okay? Number two, there must be what? A favorable money judgment. Okay? Kailangan may favorable money judgment. Uh, another requisite, number three, the lawyer should put into the records of the case that he is what? Availing this remedy, this charging lien. Paano niya mapuput into the records of the case? Probably by manifesting na i-exercise na yung kanyang charging lien. And then number four requisite to properly and validly exercise this, this charging lien, kailangan there must be notification. Notify your client. And number five, five na ba? Or six, six. There must be a proper accounting. Okay? So in that case, kung present lahat yun, the lawyer can validly exercise his charging lien. Okay? So again, yun nga, basic rule natin, a lawyer shall deliver the funds and property of his client when due or upon demand. Why? Because a lawyer cannot unilaterally appropriate the client's money for himself by the mere fact that the client owes him attorney's fees. Because the lawyer's failure to deliver 
a pandeman gives rise to the presumption of uh, misappropriation. Okay? Ano exception natin? Yan na nga. If the lawyer will exercise his retaining lien. Okay? <clears throat> so number five topic. Our fifth topic is about Champertus contract and contingent fee contract. Ano naman sir itong uh, Champertus contract and contingent fee contract? Ito yung binigay ko example kanina. Uh, yung sa tanong na how can uh, this book will help uh, law students. Kasi nga, nung binabasa ko dati yung Rule 16.04, hindi ko alam na yan na pala yung contingent fee contract. So nilalagay ko na nga sa heading, meron tayong uh, sa book, meron tayong subject heading before the rule. So nakalagay na dyan, contingent fee uh, agreement, Champertus contract agreement. So yung Rule 16. Para alam nung magbabasa na yung Rule 16 na yun is about uh, contingent fee agreement. Ano ba ngayon yung Rule 16? Section 4, ah, Rule 16.04. So, yung first uh, topic kasi dyan is about a lawyer borrowing money from his client. Pwede ba yun? Pwede. If you will uh, comply with the rule on 16.04. Kasi ang general rule natin, a lawyer is not allowed to borrow money from his uh, client. Except, except. So, pwede, ibig sabihin, pwede pala mangutang ang abogado sa kanyang client. Ano exception? Except, uh, except if the interest of the client is protected by the nature of the case or by independent advice. So, ano exception? So that the lawyer can ethically borrow money from his client. Kailangan mag-fold on na the interest of the client is protected by the nature of the case such as, uh, let's say, si client mo ay isang banko, siyempre, protected by the nature of the case yan, or by independent advice. Okay? Uh, yun. Uh, borrowing money, wala tayong problema doon. Lending money, paano naman yun? Baliktad naman. Pwede ba, so pag tinatanong ko lagi sa class, pwede ba si lawyer can, a lawyer ethically lend his money to his or her client? So sabihin, syempre, of course, yes, because it will be favorable or it will redound to the benefit of the client. But, uh, not necessarily. Why? Because ang general rule natin dyan sa 16.04 is that a lawyer is not allowed to lend his money to the client. Except, so papasok lang yung exception, if the interest, uh, except, uh, ang pinautang ni lawyer ay only necessary expenses. Okay? So again, a lawyer is not allowed to lend his money to his client. Except, in the interest of justice to advance necessary expenses. At yun na po yung tinatawag natin na contingent fee agreement. Meaning to say, a lawyer can lend his money to his client provided that, what? Ano yung requisites ng contingent fee agreement para, maging, para masabi natin valid? Uh, number one, ano daw yung pinautang under 16.04? Only necessary expenses, not all kind of expenses. So necessary expenses, number one. Number two, there must be stipulation in the contract of legal services. Anong stipulation? With regards to reimbursement. Dapat i -re reimburse din si uh, lawyer. And number three, the most important, kaya siya tinawag na contingent fee arrangement or agreement, uh, subject to the stipulation judgment contingent upon such condition na may papanalo niyo yung kaso. Okay, so yun yung uh, principle of contingent fee agreement. So it is a valid agreement. Why? Because it is provided by the CPR under Rule 16.04. Sabi nga ulit doon, a lawyer is allowed to, a lawyer generally is not allowed to lend his money to his client except in the interest of justice to advance necessary expenses. Contingent fee contract. On the other hand, ano yung unethical or void agreement in so far as to lending money ni lawyer to client. Okay? Ang bawal nga itong si Champertus contract. Ano yung Champertus contract? The lawyer will lend what? All kind all kinds of expenses. Okay? Mapa hotel niya, mapa pang uh, transportation ni client, all kinds of expenses. Number 2, there is no stipulation dun sa contract of legal services, uh, stipulation as to reimbursement. No stipulation as to reimbursement. Okay? And number three, 
uh, that the lawyer will be paid part of the property of the client under litigation. Okay? But in some cases, uh, in some cases na na-disregard na, di, di, na, di ni Supreme Court yun, basta the point is uh, in advance ni Len, pinautang ni lawyer yung kanyang client, ano yung pinautang? All kinds of expenses. And number two, not subject to reimbursement. So yung number three, uh, pwede namang wala in the sense that pwede naman siya bayaran ng hindi uh, part of the property under litigation. Basta present yung dalawa, it can be considered as um, champertus contract, which is void. Now, according to the Supreme Court, why is it that contingent fee contract is a valid contract bukod sa allowed siya under 16.04? Contingent fee contract is allowed, sabi ni Supreme Court, in a long line of cases because it will redound to the benefit of a poor client who has no means of paying the lawyer but has a meritorious cause of action. So, kaya pala valid ang ating contingent fee agreement kasi sabi ni Supreme Court, it will redound to the benefit of a poor client who has no means of paying the lawyer but has a meritorious cause of action. Otherwise, hindi tatanggapin ni lawyer yan kung hindi meritorious kasi pag natalo siya sa kaso, hindi siya babayaran. On the other hand, why is it that Champertus contract, alam na alam na mga uh, studyante natin at barista, void contract, Champertus contract, but why? Because sabi ni Supreme Court, in such case, the lawyer is acting like a merchant. Diba? Investing in a case, uh, the purpose of the lawyer is at the end to profit. And we all know that it is very unethical because in a long line of cases, sabi ulit ni Supreme Court, it is highly unethical for a lawyer to advertise his skill like a merchant because lawyering is a noble profession. It is not a trade or a business. Kaya bawal ang champ per contract. Okay, ito pala yun. Rationally, why contingent fee agreement is a valid because it will redound to the benefit of a poor client who has no means to pay for legal services but has meritorious cause of action. Rationally, bakit void ang champ per contract? Because it is as if the lawyer is acting like a merchant. Okay, next topic issue. Let's talk about ordinary and extraordinary concept of attorney's fees. So let's first define what is an ordinary concept of attorney's fees. So ordinary concept of attorney's fees, um, these are reasonable. Uh, these are reasonable compensation paid to the lawyer for his services rendered. So that is an ordinary uh, concept of attorney's fees. Okay. Reasonable compensation paid to whom? Paid to the lawyer, period, because of the legal services rendered. On the other hand, it is an extraordinary concept of attorney's fees if, ano yung ngayon extraordinary uh, concept of attorney's fees? Uh, these are uh, indemnity for damages ordered by the court to be paid by the losing party, kanino? To the winning party, not to the lawyer. So yun yung significance niya. Uh, that's why we should distinguish an ordinary concept of attorney's fees and an extraordinary concept of attorney's fees. Kasi extraordinary concept, it is uh, an indemnity for damages ordered, ordered by the court to be paid by the losing party to the winning party and not to the lawyer. Yun ang importance niya. Nasabi ko na pala. So... We should distinguish, baka manito kayo, yung two kinds of conce uh, two concept of attorney's fees, ordinary sa extraordinary. But we have also two kinds of uh, retainer fee. So ano yung dalawang klase ng retainer fee? Magkaiba yung retainer fee ha, saka yung ordinary sa extraordinary concept. Yung retainer fee, we have two kinds. General retainer and we have a special retainer. Sir, ano yung special retainer? Also, these are reasonable compensation paid to the lawyer to secure the lawyer's future services. Okay? So for the future services of the lawyer, itong retainer fee. And since we're talking about attorney's fees, siyempre, very important, uh, itong principle of quantum merit. So what is quantum merit? Pag barista tayo, pag barista tayo, alam na alam na natin, quantum merit 
is as much as he deserves. So anong ibig sabihin ng as much as he deserves? So these are reasonable compensation as much as the lawyer deserves. Sir, kailan papasok yung principle na quantum merit? So don't use this uh, principle indiscriminately because there are only five instances wherein you can use the principle of quantum merit. Okay, lima lang yan na pwede yung quantum merit. Number one, if there is no contract between the lawyer and the client. So paano mo madetermine yung uh, attorney's fee ni lawyer? Eh wala ngang kontrata. E eh, nag-render pa rin ng legal service si lawyer. Babayaran ba si lawyer? Yes, babayaran pa rin siya under the principle of quantum merit. Kasi nga, walang uh, contract. Okay? Number two, there is a contract between the lawyer and the client, but the contract is void. Okay? So void siya for whatever reason under the civil code. In such case, babayaran pa rin ba si lawyer? Babayaran pa rin kasi nag-render siya ng service. Pero probably not in accordance with the stipulated uh, uh, price or attorney's fees. But he will be as much as he deserves. Number two. Ah, number three. Sorry. Number three. There is a contract of legal services, but the attorney's fees is unconscionable. Okay? So anong ibig sabihin nun? Uh, a good illustration would be meron tayong civil case collection of 1 million and then itong si attorney uh, dahil magaling daw siya ask for a 700,000 acceptance fee. Pinrabaho niya yung kaso nanalo sila. Question, babayaran ba siya ng 700,000 given the fact that ang collection nila ay only 1 million? Of course, the lawyer will not be paid 1 million but should the lawyer be paid? Yes. The lawyer should still be paid under the principle of quantum merit. Pero magkano? Quantum merit as much as he deserves. Bakit mapasok yung quantum merit? Kasi nga, there is a contract but the attorney's fees is unconscionable. Okay? Uh, what else? Attorney's fees uh, sa quantum merit, number five, kailan mag apply itong quantum merit? If the lawyer fails to finish the case but with justifiable reason. So, hindi natapos ni lawyer yung kaso, pero may justifiable reason. Anong significance doon? Kasi there are instances wherein uh, the lawyer wasn't able to finish the case but because of an unjustifiable reason of withdrawal. Meaning to say, it is not provided under Canon 22 yung mga grounds for a lawyer to validly withdraw. So, kung ang lawyer ay Basta-basta lang nag-withdraw, na wala naman doon sa enumerated under Canon 22, the withdrawal of the lawyer is not justifiable. Therefore, even nag-render siya ng service, hindi siya mababayaran under the principle of quantum merit. On the other hand, if nag-render ng service, ng legal service tong si uh, lawyer, and si client lang ang nagtanggal, nag-terminate sa kanyang abogado without any reason, Babayaran pa rin ba si lawyer nun? Yes, babayaran pa rin siya under the principle of quantum merit as much as he deserves. Bakit, sir? Because the failure of the lawyer to finish the case is with justifiable reason. Ano yung justifiable reason? The client can at any time terminate his lawyer as long as mawalan siya ng trust and confidence because the relationship between the lawyer and the client is based on fiduciary. So kung wala ng trust and confidence, si client, for whatever reason, he can terminate the lawyer. Lawyer-client relationship, we have discussed this, case of Burbe versus Magulta. Again, mayroong attorney-client relationship. If a lawyer with regards or with respect to his uh, business or troubles of any kind approach a lawyer. And number two, the purpose of such individual is to obtain legal advice. And number three, the lawyer voluntarily permits with the consultation. Okay, anong importance niyan? Yun nga, pwedeng pumasok ang conflict of interest but definitely uh, yung principle of privileged communication can still come into the picture even though there is no attorney-client relationship. Pwede yan. I-discuss natin mamaya. So ito nga, yung mga requisite ng uh, attorney-client relationship. Okay, a person in respect to business or troubles of any kind, uh, 
trouble sa pwedeng consult sa lawyer with the view of obtaining professional uh, advice and the lawyer voluntarily permits with the consultation. Okay? So let's go now to privilege communication. Sir, ano yung sinasabi nyo na ano? Para magkaroon ng conflict of interest kasi eh, dito, uh, dito minsan nagkakaroon ng confusion. Attorney-client relationship, privilege communication, and conflict of interest. Ayusin lang natin. Attorney-client relationship is not Uh, necessarily uh, important when uh, we are talking about privilege communication. Okay? But if we talk about conflict of interest, attorney-client relationship is necessary. Why? Kasi in a privilege communication, ang first requisite ng privilege communication is that there must be an attorney-client relationship or a kind of consultation with a prospective client. Okay? So ang conjunctive verb natin is or. It's either there is an attorney-client relationship or a kind of consultancy with a prospective client. Okay? And number two, para pumasok yung privilege communication, uh, the information must be given during the professional employment. And number three, the information given uh, must be intended to be confidential. Okay? Now, here's uh, ito yung justification natin. Why is it that even though there is no attorney-client relationship, lahat ng mga dinivulge ni prospective client kay lawyer is still covered by the rule on privilege communication. Meaning to say, the lawyer cannot divulge it to anyone, even sa court. So, yun nga, sabi ni 15.02, a lawyer shall be bound Uh, by the rule on privilege communication in respect to matters disclosed to him by a prospective client. So kahit prospective client pa lang, it can be covered by the rule on privilege communication. And take note of this new case. Okay, uh, yun, mere relationship of an attorney and client does not raise the presumption of confidentiality. The client must, ito yung requisite ng attorney-client relationship, The client must intend for the communication to be confidential. Okay? Mere relationship between the lawyer and the client will uh, not necessarily raise the presumption of confidentiality. Requisites. Yan, nasabi ko na. Existing attorney-client relationship or a kind of consultancy with the prospective client with The communication was given in the course of professional employment and the most important, the communication given must be intended to be confidential. Okay? Test of conflict of interest. This is another important topic. Uh, yung mga important jurisprudence, nandito naman sa book natin. But basically, what are the tests to determine whether or not there is a conflict of interest between the lawyer and the client? So we have two kinds of tests. The first test is the inconsistency test and the second test is the confidential information test. Now, itong first test natin, yung uh, inconsistency test, tatlong test yung binigay ni Supreme Court dyan. Okay? So, isa-isahin natin. Inconsistency test, there is a conflict of interest if, number one, if the lawyer uh, will accept the second client or the second retainer. Okay? If the lawyer will uh, accept the second client or second retainer, and if such lawyer will argue for his first client, his argument for the first client will be opposed by himself if he will argue for his second client. Diba? Parang ano lang. So again, in consistency test, if the lawyer will accept the second client, okay? and if such lawyer will argue for the first client, his argument, for the first client will be opposed by himself if he will argue for the second client. Okay, so that's the first inconsistency test. Number two, if the lawyer accept the second client, okay, if the lawyer will accept the uh, second client, it will invite suspicion of unfaithfulness and double dealing in the performance of his uh, duty. Again, if the lawyer will accept the second client or second retainer, It will invite suspicion of unfaithfulness and double dealing. And the last, inconsistency test. Okay? If the lawyer will accept the second retainer, okay, it will require him to perform an act which will injuriously affect the first client. Again, if the lawyer will accept the second client, 
he will be required to perform an act which will injuriously affect the first client. So yun yung tatlong inconsistency test. Yung second kind ng uh, test natin of conflict of interest is the confidential information test. Ano naman tong confidential information test? If the lawyer will accept the second client, the lawyer will be using those confidential information obtained from the first client against the second client and vice versa. Okay? So again, confidence, uh, confidential information test, if the lawyer will accept the second client, okay, the, lo the lawyer will be using confidential information obtained from the first client against the second client and vice versa. Okay, so yun yung dalawang test of conflict of interest as held in the case of Monares versus Attorney Munoz. Nga, if he argues for one client, this argument will be opposed by him when he argues for the other client. Number two, the lawyer will require the uh, to perform an act which will injuriously affect his first client and it will invite suspicion of unfaithfulness or double dealing in the performance of his or her duty. And the other kind of test is the confidential information test. If uh, the lawyer will be using confidential information obtained from the first client against the second client. But is there an instance, is it uh, is there an instance wherein a lawyer can ethically represent conflicting interests? O pwede ba yun? Magre-represent ang isang abogado ng dalawang uh, magkalabang client. Yes, ano example? Retainer lawyer ka ng McDonald's, retainer lawyer ka ng Jollibee. Pwede ba yun? Yes, under uh, Rule 15.03, as a general rule, a lawyer is not allowed to represent conflicting interests except, ano yung exception, alam na alam natin, if there is a written consent, take note, written, dapat siya, written consent from both parties and, take note again of the conjunctive word, and after full disclosure of facts. So in such case, pwede mag-represent si lawyer ng conflicting interest. May written consent from both client and after full disclosure of facts. Under 15.03. And now, let's go now to gross immoral uh, conduct. So, anong legal basis natin dito? Um, the case of Panagsagan versus Autorne Panagsagan. Also, in the case of Advincula versus Advincula. So, this is a bar favorite. Why? Because um, a case of immorality is not always uh, a ground for disbarment. Diba? Kasi in a long line of cases, sabi ni Supreme Court, in order to be a ground for disbarment, mere immorality will not suffice. Why? Because it must be gross. And in the case of uh, Panagsagan, uh, in the case of Advincula, the Supreme Court defined gross as, meaning to say, kung may absent na elements dito, you cannot consider immorality as gross. Therefore, it is not a ground for disbarment. So let's define what is gross. Number one, it must be so corrupt. Okay? It must be so corrupt. Number two, uh, uh, that it virtually constitute a crime. Okay? Number three, committed under scandalous manner. And number four, to shock the common sense of decency. Okay? So kung may absent na isa doon, perhaps kung hindi man siya madisbar, suspend, suspension lang. But the point is, pag tinanong kayo, can the lawyer be disbarred? Pag ang tanong is disbarred, kailangan mag-concur yung apat na requirements na yon in order to consider the immorality as gross. So again, ano yon? Immorality to be a ground for disbarment, it must be gross. And according to this case, it is gross when it is so corrupt as to virtually constitute a crime committed under a scandalous manner and it must shock the common sense of decency. Okay. So next, last two topics. Okay, last two topics. So, what are the guidelines for uh, lifting of a suspension order? So, diniscuss ko rin to uh, thoroughly dito, dito sa book. Kasi before I thought, uh, nagre-review pa lang ako, if the lawyer uh, is suspended for six months, let's say January 1, 2020, 
So na-receive niya yung uh, suspension order from the Supreme Court, January 1, 2020. So after six months, uh, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, uh, kahit August. So I thought before, pagdating ng uh, August, you can immediately practice law. Kasi nga, yung six months uh, period already lapsed. But because of uh, this case, meron pala tayong mga guidelines to follow before a lawyer who was suspended, before he can thereafter uh, practice law. So ano-ano ngayon yung guidelines natin? First of all, if there is a suspension order from the Supreme Court na receive the lawyer, anong unang niyang gagawin? First thing to do is to see if the order is uh, immediately executory. Meaning to say, kung nakalagay dun sa, sa suspension order, immediately executory, from uh, receipt, tatakbo na kagad, let's say six months yung ano, ah, suspension, tatakbo na kagad yung six months. If walang nakaprovide dun sa suspension order, if may nakaprovide dun sa suspension order na immediately executory. Upon receipt niya, tatakbo na yung six months uh, period. Now, if the suspension order wala naman nakalagay na immediately executory, okay? In such case, the lawyer can still file a motion for reconsideration kung walang nakalagay na immediately executory. Now, pag-file niya ng motion for reconsideration, denied, na-receive niya. That's the only time wherein the six months, as the case may be, the six months uh, suspension will start to run from receipt of the denial of the motion for reconsideration. Okay? Now, naubos yung six months. Pwede na ba mag-practice ng law? Itong si lawyer. Not yet. Okay? As held in the case of Gumba versus Attorney Monares. Ano ang dapat gawin ni lawyer after the lapse of the period of suspension? So, unang-una, he should what? Prepare a sworn statement. So, gawa siya ng sworn statement and kailangan i-indicate niya itong dalawang uh, indispensable uh, terms. Number one, he should indicate in his uh, sworn statement that what? That he did not appear in any court during the period of suspension. And number two, that he or she desisted from the practice of law during the uh, suspend, uh, suspension period. Okay? So yun yung ilalagay niya sa uh, sworn statement niya that he desisted from the practice of law during the period of suspension and uh, he did not appear in any court during the period of suspension. So after preparing such a uh, sworn statement, second step, he should copy furnish the IBP chapter kung saan siya member and copy furnish the executive judge. Okay? Lahat ng execu executive judge which uh, meron siyang mga pending cases. Okay? So after the uh, copy furnish kay IBP chapter and uh, copy furnish kay uh, executive judge na meron siyang pending meron siyang mga pending cases. Thereafter, pwede na niya yon i-file kay Supreme Court. Okay? Pagka-file noon, Pwede na ba siya mag-practice ng law? Hindi pa rin po. The lawyer should still wait for the order of the court lifting such suspension. So that is the case of uh, Tan versus uh, Tan pala siya, Tan versus Attorney Gumba. Okay? Tan versus uh, Attorney Gumba again, unless the court explicitly state that the decision is immediately executory from the seat thereof, respondent has 15 days within which to file an MR. If the denial of the mo uh, the denial of the motion shall render the decision final and executory. So upon expiration of the period of suspension, anong gagawin ni lawyer? He shall file a sworn statement with the Supreme Court through the OBC stating that he or she desisted from the practice of law and has not appeared in any court during the period of suspension. Okay? Now, uh, after that, copies of the sworn statement shall be furnished to the local chapter of the IBP and then copy furnished more the executive judge of the courts where respondent has pending cases. Okay? 
Now, last topic. So if uh, we're talking about suspend, uh, suspension kanina, let's talk about disbarment. Paano, sir, kung na-disbar na si lawyer? Ano ang kanyang remedy? Of course, he should file a petition for reinstatement. Okay? Now, in filing a petition for reinstatement, you should first know what is the basic inquiry of the Supreme Court before it will grant or deny you yung iyong petition for reinstatement. So ano dapat ang isusulat mo sa iyong petition for reinstatement? Ano ba yung primary inquiry the Supreme Court whether or not to grant it? The primary inquiry of the Supreme Court is whether or not the lawyer has sufficiently rehabilitated himself in conduct and character. Okay, again, ang hahanapin ni Supreme Court doon sa petition for reinstatement nyo because in, uh, according to one case, the Supreme Court said that the primary inquiry of the lawyer before granting a petition for reinstatement is whether or not the lawyer has sufficiently rehabilitated himself in conduct and character taking into consideration four things. So, i-consider muna ni Supreme Court yung, yung apat na bagay bago niya ma-determine kung whether or not the lawyer has sufficiently rehabilitated himself in conduct and character. First thing to consider ay yung acts. This is the disbarment. Ha? Acts prior, acts and conduct prior to the disbarment. This is number one. Number two, offense charge. Ano ba yung offense charge ni lawyer sa disbarment uh, case niya? Number three, conduct and act of the lawyer after the disbarment. Okay? So yung third consideration ng Supreme Court. Itinan niya yung act and conduct of the lawyer after the disbarment. And the last one, the, uh, the time lapse from the time of the disbarment up to the time of the filing of the petition for reinstatement. Why, sir? Because kung less than five years yan, uh, it will be denied. Kasi masyadong mabilis. Okay? So again, Petition for reinstatement. What is the basic inquiry of the SC in granting such petition? Legal basis natin is the case of K versus Attorney Revilla. Sabi ni Supreme Court, only those who establish their present moral fitness and knowledge of the law will be readmitted to the bar. And it will consider whether the lawyer has sufficiently rehabilitated himself uh, in conduct and character. Okay? So, um, with that, um, thank you for uh, no, listening. Uh, sana meron kayong natutunan. So, I'll give the mic to uh, Ma'am Dayan. Thank you for listening again. Thank you for the very rich presentation, Attorney Anciano. We are very honored to receive such expert guidance, especially at a time when the study and practice of law have become more challenging. In behalf of Rex Education, allow me to congratulate you on yet another feather in your cap with the release of this book. We look forward to learning more from you through your books and lectures. Congratulations, attorney. And here's to more Thank years of working together as stewards of legal education. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. So just a reminder, just to remind everyone that we have a question and answer portion in the latter part of the program. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to comment your questions below. And now to share more about our author's commitment to legal education, share some reactions to warmly welcome virtually Attorney Teresita Aquino Tuazon, Second Division Clerk of Court, Supreme Court of the Philippines. Good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this rare opportunity to be a part of this momentous event. Attorney Eric Anciano is not only a friend, he is family to the second division where his ever supportive and beautiful wife, Idel, is a colleague of mine. To start with, uh, we have this uh, common saying that teaching is a noble profession because a teacher must possess a heart full of patience and understanding, the courage to do what is right for the sake of their students, and a profound feeling for teaching even if it's exhausting. Attorney Eri not only surpasses set qualifications, he even exerted an extra mile 
by feeling the gaps between learning the law and understanding the same in the context of jurisprudence. With this book, Attorney Eric has mastered a welcome addition to the corpus of reading materials on this important field but often taken for granted. With face-to-face -face class restricted because of the current pandemic, the time is opportune for the students, more so of the bar examinees, to take a second and closer look on the prevailing rules and updates in legal ethics. These provisions are relevant to each and every one of us because ethics should be a part and parcel of our modern life especially in the forthcoming elections where lawyers will be busy filing, uh, filing cases of disqualification and cancellation of certificates of candidacy. Lawyers should be reminded that it should be done not only within, within the context of the law, but equally to the ethical and professional standards provided by the Code of Professional Responsibility and definitely not for personal interest. With extraordinary diligence surpassing even that uh, required of the canons, Attorney Eric had examined these provisions and correlated them with the most recent and landmark jurisprudence in the field. It is scholarly yet accessible, broad in scope, yet in-depth in, in analysis. This book will be of great help to students and teachers alike and a generous reference for both the bench and bar. More so certainly put, it is one for the books. I have the highest confidence that it will garner the wide patronage it well and truly deserves. I will treasure my copy, which she has personally autographed, and look forward to sharing it to the next generation. To Attorney Eric Anciano, my warm congratulations on a job well done. Mabuhay ka. Thank you very much, Attorney Tuazon. At this point, we will now be hearing more about how the works of Attorney Frederick Ayanshano can help in paving the way of our future lawyers. Let us all give a warm welcome to Attorney Joyce Jasmine Dimaisip, Kunanan, Acting SC Senior Chief Staff Officer, Supreme Court Library. Updates of Jurisprudence and Notes in Legal Ethics by Attorney Frederick Anciano is comprehensive and informative, yet concise and direct to the point. It is a useful guide for those who are studying the law and an excellent source of materials for those who are teaching the law. The book is also a good reference material for those who are practicing as they will be informed of the latest jurisprudence regarding legal ethics. Legal ethics is oftentimes neglected and treated as a minor subject by lawyers. However, lawyers must learn to appreciate and remember the significance of it as it is quoting attorney Eric, that branch or moral science which treats of the duties which an attorney owes to the court, his client, his colleagues, and to the public. Indeed, the Supreme Court Library is very fortunate that the book of Attorney Eric is included in our collection. Thank you very much, Attorney Kunanan. And to tell us more about our authors and this new book, let us hear from Honorable Franklin J. de Monteverde, regular member, judicial, and bar counsel. Good morning. Uh, at the outset, let me extend my congratulations first to Attorney Frederick I. Anciano for writing yet another comprehensive book, and this time, Updates of Jurisprudence and Notes in Legal Ethics, published by the Rex Bookstore. I always believe that legal ethics is the very core of the legal profession. However, the subject is just given a scant attention or consideration in law schools and even in the bar examinations. In contrast to the belief that it would barely affect one standing in the examination, legal ethics as a subject plays a vital role. 
having a hefty portion of that 5% may decide on whether or not a bar candidate will be admitted to the role of attorneys. This is why I am elated to know that Attorney Anciano came up with a book focused on ethics and latest jurisprudence. This is a step to promote deeper understanding and appreciation of legal ethics, not just for law students, but also for the members of the bar and the bench. As legal ethics professor and lecturer, he passionately revisited the basic principles of ethics and the latest cases decided by the Supreme Court in order to substantiate the contents of the book that will serve as a guide to the readers in learning the subject well. The book also contains notes which are carefully written by the author himself based on the applicable laws of your students in legal ethics. It is worth mentioning that the book is concise and an easy read, which is best fit for students and bar candidates who are already under pressure studying. It can also be a good companion for lawyers in drafting their pleadings and a hefty or handy reference for magistrates in deciding their cases. And once again, I congratulate Attorney Anciano for his new book, Updates of Jurisprudence and Notes in Legal Ethics. And to all our law students, bar takers, and lawyers who do not have a copy of the book yet, please get yours now. You won't regret it. Thank you for all these kind words, Attorney Tuazon, Attorney Dimaisip Kunanan, and Honorable De Monte Verde. Hearing your praises of the book gives us utmost pride for having been chosen and entrusted with the publication of this masterpiece. In the same vein, allow us to express our gratitude to you as well for being stewards of legal education. Now we're opening the floor for the question and answer with our author, Attorney Frederick Anciano. So feel free to comment your questions below. We will be selecting three questions from the comments. And as we move forward, I will be reading the questions in behalf of our author. All right, do you have any questions from the audience? Okay, Attorney, we have uh, a question box. From Sheila Baino Endrina. If a lawyer is a government employee of an office performing a quasi judicial function, but who resigns therefrom, can he appear before such office representing a client, or is there any prohibition thereof? Um, yes, um, if a lawyer uh, was, a poor, uh, was a former. Um, government lawyer engaged in a uh, quasi-judicial function in yung kanyang office, under the CPR, he is not allowed after resigning to uh, be a counsel or to engage in any matter involving yung kanyang uh, former uh, government office. Because under uh, RA 6713, uh, such lawyer is prohibited for uh, one year uh, to um, uh, to have a client or to have a to have a, a client that is it is related to the uh, former government office meaning to say if there is a case between the former government office and yung client na kukunin niya uh, first of all it, it is prohibited for him because uh, there will be a conflict of interest there will be uh, presence of the confidentiality information test and then also it will be a violation of the CPR, which provides that a lawyer cannot uh, accept any office wherein such lawyer was a former lawyer of such government office and yung kanyang client na tatanggapin ay a, a client which has something to do with the uh, former government office of the lawyer. So, yun yung prohibition niya under RA 6713 is prohibited to uh, engage in any matter uh, 
involving uh, in relation to his uh, former official uh, office. And of course, uh, another prohibition, nga, there will be an existence of a conflict of interest applying the principle of confidential information test because yung mga information na acquire niya from the uh, first client, he will uh, use it uh, against uh, the former client. So there will be a violation of uh, uh, pre or presence of conflict of interest. That's all. Thank you, attorney. We have another question from Joanne Victoria. Can the client file a disbarment if lawyers suddenly did not attend the promulgation of judgment? Uh, yes, I, I think so. Uh, such lawyer can be um, penalized, uh, perhaps uh, just a suspension or maybe disbarment because it is a violation of the CPR because the CPR provides that a lawyer shall not neglect a legal matter entrusted to him by his client. So violation siya ng CPR provision na yun. And since it is a violation of the CPR, it can be a ground for disbarment complaint. So, uh, bahala na lang si Supreme Court kung suspension lang siya or uh, disbarment. But the point is, there is a of the CPR. So, he or she can file a disbarment complaint. Thank you, attorney. For our third question from Shelito Santos. Is there prohibition if the lawyer is a president of a university or college? Prohibition. If a lawyer, if such lawyer is a president of a school? Yes, university or college. I don't think there is any prohibition. Um, a lawyer uh, who is a president of a uh, college or school, I don't think uh, such lawyer is engaging in uh, official in his or her official function. Hindi naman siya a government employee. So I think uh, he or she is not prohibited to practice law. Because who are those prohibited? Only those falling before absolute prohibition, such as the president, vice president, cabinet members, its deputies and secretaries, uh, incumbent judge and justices. Wala naman siya doon. Ombudsman, wala naman siya. Fiscal, wala naman siya. And other rules na similar, which prohibits a lawyer to practice uh, practice law. But the, I think the point is if this, if such school is not a government-owned uh, school, uh, I don't think he will be prohibited to practice uh, private practice, to engage in prob, uh, private practice if he or she is a president of a uh, school or university. Hindi rin naman siya nag-fall dun sa restrictive prohibition. Uh, that's all. Thank you, attorney. We have our last question from Joy Navarro. Is there a need to attach clearance certifications from courts to the sworn statements of the suspended lawyer who already served the penalty of suspension? Um, in the case that we've discussed, there is no requirement for the lawyer who was suspended to attach a certification. Uh, he just need to require, uh, he just need to comply with the requirement of giving a copy furnish of his or her sworn statement, which indicates therein that uh, he desisted from the practice of law during the uh, period of suspension. And uh, he did not appear in any court sworn statement, yun ang ilalagay niya. He did not appear in any court during the period of suspension and just copy furnish it dun sa IBP local chapter and dun sa executive judge na meron siyang pending cases. It does not uh, require that there must be a clearance coming from such court, yung lower court na meron siyang mga pending cases. There's no such requirement. So after that, after complying that, copy furnish mo na, nasa yun yung uh, uh, sworn statement, you can file it before the Office of the Bar Confident and just wait for the uh, order of the Supreme Court lifting the order of suspension. So there is no requirement for a clearance from the lower court. That's all. 
Thank you, attorney. And that's the end of our question and answer portion. So before we proceed with the online raffle, attorney, do you have any advice for our 2020-2021 barristers and future lawyers who are with us today? Oh, okay. Um, for those who will uh, take the bar this coming January, um, of course, you have yung two years, yung mga nauna ng uh, gumraduate. You have your two years. But though na nag-graduate lang this year, uh, this year. So, you still have uh, more time to review. Ang um, moto ko lang for those um, nagtitake ng bar, yung iba dyan kasi parang napapagod na, gusto na mag-give up. Um, pwede naman kayo magpahinga basta as long as yung pahinga nyo, meron pa rin uh, some sort of review. So, ang moto natin na bibigay dyan is yung audio lecture lang ang pahinga. So, if you're tired reviewing, you can rest, but uh, as much as possible, lagay yung earphone, listen to lectures of your lecturers from your uh, review centers. And of course, um, yung health. Yung health nyo, the, the, this is very important kasi kahit na anong aral nyo, if magkasakit kayo during uh, the period of the bar exam, during sa January, um, parang wala, mahirap pa rin mag-exam kung may sakit ka. So, take care of your health. Drink your vitamins, uh, eat sufficient food, huwag magpapalipas uh, ng gutom dahil gusto nyo mag-review. Uh, take care of your health, yun nga, kumain kayo ng oras, uh, drink vitamins. And very important, quality sleep. So uh, I'm suggesting uh, for those barrister na nagre-review ng hating gabi hanggang madaling araw, i-convert nyo na from madaling araw hanggang gabi. Why? Because yung body clock natin, pagdating ng bar exam, mag exam tayo umaga hanggang hapon. So baka mamaya mabigla yung body clock natin, uh, gabi nag-function yung utak natin. So uh, as early as possible, ngayon pa lang, uh, try to uh, review morning up to hapon or gabi. And wag yung hating gabi hanggang madaling araw. And uh, of course, don't forget uh, to pray pray and pray. And don't worry, magiging abogado kayo, just uh, give everything you can. And as I have said nga, um, audio lecture lang pahinga. And that's all, that's all. Good luck, good luck to all barristers this, ano, uh, 20, this coming January. Thank you very much, Attorney Frederick I. Anciano. And once again, congratulations. Thank you. All right. This time, as promised, we will now be giving away one copy of this new book, who will be the lucky one to win the book Updates of Jurisprudence and Notes in Legal Ethics by our beloved author, Attorney Frederick I. Anshano. Again, reminder, we will be announcing the name of the lucky person for, for this raffle wheel. If your name is called, please, please comment down present so we know you're here with us. We will then verify it's, if it's you who won. However, if it's after 30 seconds, we did not see any comment, we will be drawing another winner from our list of registrants. So, good luck! All right, congratulations to Anne Margaret Garcia Gomez. Once again, congratulations to Anne Margaret Garcia Gomez. Miss Anne, if you're here with us today, kindly comment present on the comment section so we can verify if it's you. We will be giving you 30 seconds to comment present on the comment section. Once again, Miss Anne Margaret Garcia Gomez.
All right, congratulations, Ms. Anne Margaret Garcia Gomez. You have won a copy of Attorney and China's new book entitled Updates of Jurisprudence and Notes in Legal Ethics. So a Rex representative will be sending you an email regarding the details on how to claim your prize. Once again, congratulations, Ms. Anne Margaret Garcia Gomez. All right, on that note, we have come to the end of this afternoon's program. Indeed, it was a very productive learning afternoon with our legal luminaries, Attorney Frederick Ian Shano, and our distinguished guests. In behalf of Rex Education, I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude for having been chosen as your partner in legal education. We look forward to more years of our fruitful partnership as we continue to work together to enable law students and lawyers to achieve their dreams of becoming lawyers and excelling as one. To everyone who joined us this afternoon, thank you for learning with us and for choosing Rex to be your partner in learning. See you all on our next book launch and lecture. Thank you and keep sorting, Edo Campeones.